So my name is Joe Perez. I'm a senior systems analyst and team leader at the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. I liaise between folks that are high-level government and high-level both on the technical side and on the business side, hopefully trying to uh, arrange projects that everybody can be pleased with, ensuring that we, need, we meet the needs of both the business side and the technical side in the data warehouse that I help run. So this afternoon, my keynote topic was facilitating innovation in a post-COVID-19 world. I gave a three-pronged approach of recognize, resolve, and respond. The way that people can be challenged, especially those that are working in government. You know, there's this stereotype that people who work in government are lazy or that they don't care or that they seem to do things in an inefficient manner. And so my challenge is for people to break out of their comfort zone, go the extra mile, and simply blow away the status quo. You know, I'm a firm believer that if you're not innovating, you're stagnating. And because of everything that's been going on with COVID-19 in the last couple of years, and it's mostly in our rearview mirror by now, I believe it's imperative, especially for those of us that work in government, to want to see an expectation, not as a thing that should be met, but as a thing that should be exceeded. And to continue that agile mindset, that spirit of innovation that came about as a result of the pivoting that had to take place during COVID, I'm saying keep it going. Just because COVID is mostly behind us, don't stop now. Continue. Break away from that mold and don't give people an opportunity to think that government employees don't care. And the way we do that is by going the extra mile, adopting that innovative mindset and the, the tips that I gave in my, in my presentation recognize, resolve, and respond. So one of our uh, top priorities in the data warehouse at uh, Health and Human Services of North Carolina, where I work, DHHS, um, we have gone through a massive transformation where our database system that we used was, a, was based on Sybase, and it's now based on Oracle. Um, the infrastructure was upgraded, the network was upgraded, and the database system also was upgraded. Our capacity, our speed, our processing power, everything was enlarged to be able to serve the public more efficiently. That came to be a, a very extensive project, which required quite a bit of fit gapping and ensuring that everything would convert properly. Not only did we have to convert all the data, we also had to convert quite a number of the ETLs, uh, pulling the data from all the disparate data sources into the data warehouse. Uh, the code had to be made compatible to work together with Oracle, which has a syntax that's a bit different from Sybase. I don't want to get too much into the weeds, but it was a very extensive project um, and quite a few hands had to get into that cookie jar to make sure that it all worked well. We worked with some vendors. Uh, we worked with the businesses to test the data, not only in pulling queries from the databases themselves, but also the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the reporting layer on top of that, that the folks out in the counties were using. We've got over 8,000 of those users, 7,500 at the time that that was done. We've grown since then. Um, but they all had to test to ensure that all their reports would work. So it was a massive undertaking. Um, and, you know, my philosophy in that type of thing is if you have a multifaceted problem, it takes a multidisciplinary solution in order to affect something that can be beneficial to all. Now, as far as tools, um, we're now using Oracle Exadata as far as the tools for the database is concerned. Uh, our reporting tools are in the process of being upgraded, but the, the main top layer forward-facing reporting tool is SAP Business Objects. Um, we are looking to expand and get into more of the data analytics realm with reporting tools such as Tableau and Microsoft Power BI. Because what, what we're seeing is that decision makers need to be able to draw insight from, from the data that, that we see. You know, anybody can make a pretty pretty graph. Anybody can click on a link. Anybody can 
go into Excel and bam, 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 boom, you come up with a nice, pretty looking graph. But is it right? Is it accurate? You know, does it look good or does it work? Is it pretty or is it right? So yes, we do want to present data in a way that's visually compelling, but it also has to be correct. So that's been another uh, major initiative that we've undergone to turn into less, well, yeah, we continue to be at more of an, of an operational data warehouse, but we also want to get into more of the predictive analytics uh, into the realm of, say, you're looking at these reports not just for your operational concerns, but also for your more strategic concerns, like how can you forecast what's going to happen? How can you quantify how well the social workers are doing and the other stats and, and facts and figures and so forth that you're looking at to gauge whether or not you are meeting the needs of the public in, uh, in North Carolina for health and human services. So all this is a, it's an educational effort. It's an infrastructure effort. Once again, another multifaceted issue that requires a multidisciplinary approach to get a solution that is beneficial to all. So again, I love being thrown into the thick of it, and uh, it's great to see how the public is going to be served by this initiative to ensure that we are serving them to the absolute best of our ability. Okay. I believe collaboration is all about transparency. You know, um, again, I mentioned earlier the, the stereotype, and I talked about this a little bit in my, in my presentation, uh, talking about the stereotypes that people sometimes get when they think about government agencies and the job that they do and the efficiency with which they do it, sometimes the lack thereof. Um, but in our case, uh, where I work, Health and Human Services, we have to be transparent with the public because there is quite a bit of sensitive data. When you're talking about people's health, you're talking about uh, adoption records, you're talking about um, uh, placement of children um, in, in different homes, things that are going on in, uh, uh, in the social work, uh, aging and adult services, and all those different divisions within Health and Human Services in North Carolina. So there's quite a bit of data. There's quite a bit of sensitive data. And because it is so sensitive, it has to be treated with the utmost of care uh, to ensure that only the people that are supposed to see this particular data can see it. In order to accomplish that, it takes not only the transparency so that people will know precisely what the data is, where we're storing it, and how we're handling these you know, privacy concerns and so forth, it also takes the collaboration of the public, the, the understanding that, okay, you want to be able to derive insight from the data, you therefore have to give us that data. Okay, it's not like they're giving up their privacy, they have to give their consent in order for us to be able to get all the data that, that we need to accomplish the goal of people who need to derive the insight. So that takes collaboration, and you're not going to get cooperation unless you have collaboration. You are not going to achieve compromise without collaboration either because, you know, you have both parties, they have needs, they have wants, and they have an agenda that they wish, some purpose that they wish to accomplish. So in that transparency, in that collaboration, the only way that we're going to know that we are indeed uh, achieving some sort of mutual benefit is if we have that open line of communication and collaboration so that we both know what is the end goal. We have the same end goal in mind. We might have different means of achieving it. But with that collaboration, we can ensure that the efforts don't get duplicated and we can ensure that it's done in an efficient manner and in a way that, again, getting back to that overall mantra is serving the public to the very best of our ability. You know, I'm convinced that it's all about innovation, okay? Any event that's going to emphasize putting people into an innovative mindset is going to be beneficial, not just for those who attend, but also for the organizers, for the speakers, for the sponsors, um, for the venue and, and everyone else involved. Because every time you put together an event that's going to create value, that's going to create camaraderie amongst those that are attending. Uh, it's also going to create a sense of well-being, knowing that if I go to an event that's put together by the public sector network, well, then I know I'm going to derive value from it. 
as a speaker, I will gain value because I will have had the opportunity to share with folks the knowledge that I've been given, the privilege that I've been given. And to me, I count that as a great honor and responsibility. Uh, the people who attend, they win from it because they will have gained some nugget of knowledge that they need to uh, further and enhance their abilities and their talents and their uh, the, the things that they're supposed to be doing when they go back to their office or place of business, place of work, whatever, um, utilizing and applying the knowledge that they've gained in such an event as this. So how do you do that? You bring in top-notch people. How do you enhance the, um, the, the camaraderie and the networking? You do it by choosing a great venue, um, by uh, facilitating the ability of people to be able to network, such as the round tables. Uh, it's not just um, a single track lecture, 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 lecture all day long. You know, you have various different types of things. Either uh, you might have just one person talking, you might have a panel, and then you let people to break up into roundtables where they discuss some topic, some suggested seed topic that stimulates their understanding, their imagination, and facilitates that conversation. So people are sitting at the table instead of just sitting there with their hand in their, you know, in their head in their hands. They're going to sit there. They're going to start talking to each other. What's that going to do? Well, then they begin to be able to share the things that are important with them, and they're going to gain insights from the people that are across the table from them that they never would have thought was coming. You know, the people who are speaking, they already have a specific topic that they have prepared, but they, you don't know what's going to be on the mind or the heart of the person that's sitting around the table. They come from different backgrounds, different cities, different organizations, whatever. Yeah, they may all work for the government or the majority of them anyway. Uh, so there is going to be some common bonds, you know. Uh, those of us who work in government, there are certain little nuances and quirks that we're familiar with that people in private industry are not. And some of those things will come out in these conversations. So an organization like Public Sector Network, who puts together an event like this, who um, will facilitate and make it easier, of course, that's what facilitate means, they make it easier for the people attending it to stimulate that conversation. And the, that's the thing that I enjoy the most, getting back to your, to your question. Because when you have a variety of different types of activities to do, whether it be in a structured setting such as the round table or an unstructured setting such as a get together afterwards with a bunch of little tables and serving, you know, the different uh, drinks and little hors d'oeuvres and stuff. Again, formally or informally, you have facilitated the ability for conversation to take place. And the more conversation you have, I think that conversation facilitates that camaraderie. The camaraderie facilitates the collaboration that facilitates cooperation, and that ends up creating value for any for for everybody involved. So, what's going to happen? Well, come the next event, they're going to say, you know what? I'm going to go to an event sponsored by PSN. Where else can I go? Where else am I going to get that kind of value? You know, that's the kind of attitude that you create when you put together an event like this, when you have the, um, the teams behind the scenes that are making the connections and doing the work and coming up with the ideas that put together such a program. People don't think about that. They just think, oh, well, it just all comes together. No, you guys are the glue that sticks it all together. You guys are the heart and soul of this whole organization. And through your efforts, that value is created, an event is successful, and people come out of it better than what they were when they walked into the room. I think when you can say that, you can call that successful any day of the week. That's, that's my take on it.